Hi everyone, I'm Yasmin from Tutorfly and today we'll be reviewing important concepts and information for AP Calculus AB exam. We will go over the exam format, key terms and formulas, useful tips followed by some practice problems. First comes the multiple choice part of the exam. In the first section, you will be answering 30 questions in 60 minutes. You're not allowed to use a calculator in this section. After, you will have 45 minutes to answer 15 multiple choice questions, and in this part, you're expected to use a, your, your calculator. In the second half of the exam, you need to answer a total of six free response questions. In the first section, you have 30 minutes to answer two free response questions. These questions will require a calculator, but you still have to show all your work in great detail in all free response sections. In the second section, you will have 60 minutes to answer four, res four free response questions. In the last section, you're not allowed to use a calculator. Remember that you're not allowed to go look at other sections during the test, and you have to finish your work in the allotted time for that section. Okay, let's start by reviewing some key concepts about limits. When a limit gives you an undefined solution, one way to approach it is by changing the format to something that is familiar to us. After reformatting it, if you end up with a ratio, 0 over 0, try factoring the given function to see if anything cancels out. Usually, this will get rid of the components that make the function 0 over 0 and will give us a solvable limit. If that doesn't work, using the L'Hopital's rule will definitely give us a solvable limit. In L'Hopital's rule, you need to take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator separately. Do not apply the quotient rule, as that will give a different answer than what is expected here. If you end up with a ratio that is infinity over infinity, check which part of the ratio, the numerator or the denominator, is growing more rapidly. It is useful to remember this formula and it saves you time, but you know that you can also check by giving relatively large, large numbers to x and analyze the change. If you end up with a function in the format of infinity minus infinity, then multiplying the function given by its conjugate will give a solvable limit. Remember, conjugates are generally used to get rid of square root and are generated by changing the sign between the two terms in the function. For example, for a plus 3, the conjugate would be a minus 3. And when we multiply a function by its conjugate, we always get the square of the first term minus the square of the second term. For a limit to exist at a specific point a, the limit approaching a from the left side and the right side should be equal. And for a function to be continuous at a specific point a, f of a should also be equal to the limit from left and right. According to the intermediate value theorem, if f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, and if k is in between f of a and f of b, then there's a c in that interval such that f of c gives us k. This theorem is useful when estimating limit values in a given interval. It's useful to remember that the limit of sine x over x, when x is going to 0, gives us the ratio of x's coefficients, in this case 1. The same trick also holds for 10, 10 of x. Now let's look at some important concepts and derivatives. It is crucial to remember the derivatives of popularly used trick fun functions. Knowing these by heart will save you time and will even help you in integration problems. When taking derivatives of more complex functions, product, quotient, and chain rules will help you both save time and minimize errors. Use the product rule to calculate the derivative of a function that could be written as a multiplication of two functions, such as x minus 4 times sine of x. Use the quotient rule to calculate the derivative of a function given in a ratio form like lmx over x squared. In both of these methods, be extremely careful with the order of the terms. The chain rule helps us derivate a function that is inside another function. For example, for f of x squared plus 4x would be equal to f prime times 2x plus 4. If you come across a function in the format of ax plus b over cx plus d, you can quickly calculate the derivative as ad minus bc over cx plus d squared instead of using the quotient rule. This will save you time and eliminate possible errors. When taking the derivative of a function at an absolute value, you have to use the formula given to assign the correct sign at a given value. Okay, now let's talk about the implications of the first and second derivative. The first derivative shows us the direction of change in fx. When f prime is negative, f is decreasing. There's a change in the negative direction. And when f prime is positive, 
f is increasing, and that means there's a change in the positive direction. When f prime is equal to zero, we can't predict a change at this point. These points are called critical points as they define extrema points like local minimums or maximums of the function given. The second derivative shows us the rate of change in the curviness of the function. Recall that when you take the second derivative of a line, you will get zero, meaning that the original function does not curve. When the second derivative of f is negative, our function f will be concave down, and, in, and when it is positive, our function f will be concave up. When the second derivative is equal to zero, we don't have information about the curviness of the function at that given point. Keep in mind that these points are usually what is called inflection points, and here we can observe a change in the concavity of the function. Another useful tip to keep in mind is that the second derivative of f acts as the first derivative of f prime, meaning that the sign of the second derivative gives us information about the direction of change of f prime. Moving on to the integrals. One of the most important concepts is the Riemann sum. Riemann sum formula is used to find an area under the curve using rectangles. The main idea is as delta x, base of the rectangles, decreases, we come closer and closer to the actual area under the curve. Keep in mind that using inscribed versus circumscribed rectangles gives different results. Inscribed rectangles gives us an underestimation of the area, whereas circumscribed rectangles gives us an overestimation of the area. It is useful to remember that when you come across an integral in the form of dx over x, the result will be an ln function. This comes from ln's derivative being x prime over x. Memorizing the integrals of important trig functions, like shown here, will both save you time and help you solve problems by substituting one for the other. When solving partial integrals with the given formula, use the acronym LAPTE to determine what to assign to u. L stands for log functions, A stands for arc functions, P stands for polynomials, T stands for trig functions, and E stands for exponential functions. After assigning u according to this order, assign everything else to dv and solve the integral according to the formula. One of the most common questions in the exam is calculating the volume of a shape that, that is generated by rotating a curve along a line, usually x or y axis. In these situations, use the formula given. If you're rotating the curve along the y axis, make sure to form your integral in the form of fy dy from a to b, where a and b are values on the y-axis and not on the x-axis. Now that we're done with the major concepts covered in the exam, let's look at some important concepts that are here and there. Even functions are functions that are symmetric with, with respect to the y-axis. f of minus x will be equal to fx. Um, fx equals x squared is an example of an even function that comes up in the exam frequently. Odd functions are symmetric, symmetric with respect to the origin. f of minus x is equal to minus f of x. x cubed is an example of an odd, odd function. e over x and ln x are functions that, are, that come up frequently in the exam. Remember how they look like and that they're inverses of each other. In velocity, acceleration, and position problems, remember which concept comes from derivating or integrating the given function. Transitions between p of x, v of x, and a of x are pretty common in the exam. Also remember that speed function is the absolute value of the velo velocity function, meaning that in speed we only care about the magnitude and in velocity we also have direction of mo motion shown by a plus or minus sign. To find the average slope in a continuous interval, use the formula given. Remember that c does not have to be right in the middle of the closed interval from a to b, but it has to be in that interval. Vertical asymptotes are in the format of x equals a. Your curve should never meet the vertical asymptotes since a signifies a value that makes the function undefined. Horizontal asymptotes are in the format of y equals a and can be taught as the limit of the function as x goes to plus or minus infinity. Remember that it is okay for your, for your function to cut the horizontal asymptotes. 
although drawing graphs is not that common in the exam, you will have questions where you will need to estimate the behavior of a curve in a given integral. In those questions, it is useful to be able to sketch a rough draft of the curve. First, start by checking the domain. In what interval does this curve lie? What are the values that make the function undefined and what should be excluded from the domain? While doing this, focus on the denominators, even powered roots, and log functions as they have specific restrictions for their domains. After, find the limit of the function going to plus and minus infinity to be able to imagine the curve on a bigger scale rather than a small interval. After, find the points where the curve meets x and y axes. As a final step, use the first and second derivative to determine the direction of change and the concavity of the curve. Make sure to note local and absolute extrema points and inflection points. Another useful tip is to use slope fields. Use f prime to calculate the slope of a function at given points such as 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, minus 1, etc. according to what values fit the function and your in interval best. After doing this for multiple points, you will have a general shape of the curve. Now, some things you should be paying attention during the exam. Don't forget that there is no penalty for wrong answers. Show all your work and explain if necessary, even when you are using a calculator. Don't spend too much time on one questions and do not round partial answers as they might affect the results in the next sections. Make sure to read instructions and questions carefully. Underlining or circling important parts might help. Don't forget to put the units next to your answers due to necessary conversions when needed. You should check to approve models for calculators from the AP manual and make sure your calculator is on the list of approved models before the exam date. Make sure you're comfortable with the properties of your calculator and that you have enough battery for the duration of the exam. Now let's start doing some practice problems. Remember that in multiple choice questions, you do not need to show all your work, but it is recommended since it will help you make less mistakes. Since we get an undefined expression when we try to solve this limit, we need to find a different approach. This simple substitution lets us rewrite the limit in a way that we can solve it easily. Now, when we rewrite, rearrange the equ equation according to the substitution, we get limit of h going to 0 of sine of p minus h over h. Now, we know that sine of p minus h is equal to sine of h. So this just gives us the ratio of the coefficients of h. So the answer of this limit is 1. The graph of f prime gives us the rate of change for fx, where f prime is equal to 0 is our critical point in terms of the direction of change, increasing or decreasing for fx. Now f prime is equal to 0 in x equals 1 and x equals 3. So let's draw our table to put in the values for fx and f prime. Now we know that f prime is positive in this integral and negative and positive in these integrals. And we know that f of x is going to be increasing, decreasing, and in increasing in this region. So that makes x equals 1 at the local maximum and x equals 3 to the local minimum. In this question, we're asked to find the volume of a figure generated by rotating a figure along the line y equals 8. When we rotate this shape along a line, we get an outer radius and an inner radius that is empty space. So in order to find the volume, we have to find the difference between these two regions. The outer radius r can be calculated by finding the distance from line y equals 1 over 3x plus 1 to the line y equals 8. And the inner radius can be find by find it, finding the distance from y equals 1 over 2x squared plus 3 to the line y equals 8. After calculating the inner and outer radius, we calculate our function by taking their difference. After, we plug in the values we have to our volume formula and integrate it. In order to find the temperature of the pizza at t equals 5, 
we have to have a definite integral to calculate the overall change of the temperature of the pizza. This definite integral is equal to the temperature at t equals 5 minus temperature at t equals 0. Now we know that at t equals 0, our temperature is 350 Fahrenheit. When we solve the definite integral, we get minus 238. And when we plug in everything that we know, we can see that at t equals 5, the temperature of the pizza will be 112 degrees. We know that the initial position of the object is 10 feet. So S0 could be equal to 10. And we know that the initial velocity is equal to 160 feet per second. We also know that acceleration function is minus 32 feet per second squared. When we integrate the function for acceleration, we will get the function for velocity. By using the information given, we can calculate the exact function of velocity. After, we repeat the same procedure to find the equation for the position function. So we integrate the velocity function, we use the specific value given to find the plus c, and we have our position function. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for watching. If you want to know more about Tutorfly, you can visit our website, tutorfly.org.